Hey everybody, welcome to this episode of B2B Revealed. B2B Revealed brings you the best of B2B. Whether you're a B2B seller, B2B marketer, or simply a B2B leader, this show will provide you the tools and insights you need to be successful. My name is Sean Campbell. I'm the CEO of Cascade Insights, and I'm your host. I love to hear from listeners. If you have any questions about the show, or you'd like to suggest a topic I should cover in the future, just email me at sean, S-E-A-N, at cascadeinsights.com. And if you love this show, don't forget to write up a review for the show on iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you happen to listen. On this episode, I'll be tackling net neutrality, and I'll be interviewing Ryan Single. Ryan is a media and strategy fellow at Stanford Law School Center for Internet and Society. Single also covered net neutrality, privacy, security, surveillance, and tech policy for Wired for a decade. Single, finally, is the CEO and founder of Contextly, an engagement platform for publishers. In short, I'm sure you're going to love hearing what Ryan has to say about net neutrality and how changes to it might impact both small and large businesses. Ryan, welcome to the show. Sean, thanks for having me on. Awesome. Why don't you give folks a little bit more about your background? I gave a little bit of an intro at the start, but I'm sure they'd love to hear just a little bit more. Sure. I first started getting acquainted with net neutrality when I was a writer and editor at Wired from 2002 to 2012. Then left Wired, got frustrated with the tools we had to get readers deeper into stories. So I left to start my own company called Contextly. We're a B2B company. Publishers pay us to give them good technology to get readers coming back and get the right stories to the right readers. And now uh, net neutrality has been very important to me. And I got the opportunity to work at Stanford as a fellow for the year. So now i um, splitting time between the company and Stanford. Excellent. So yeah, you've got a lot of background to bring to bear to this. So let's start, though, with some foundational points, just because obviously a lot of folks might have seen a lot of headlines. Maybe they've read in-depth articles or they've only read a couple. What is net neutrality as it stands today? Net neutrality, the basic principle is that the companies that we pay to get online as consumers, right, the Comcast, AT&T, and Verizons of the world, should not be able to interfere with the choices of content, websites, apps, and services that we use. Those protections both help consumers, and they also protect the innovation economy. We've seen such an explosion in the last 20 years. So what's the current changes that are being asked for at this point? The FCC has been concerned about net neutrality or sort of net neutrality protections for a very long time, starting back in 2004 when the Republican chair, Michael Powell, warned the broadband industry not to muck with the interesting stuff happening on the internet. Now, Chairman Pai is looking to repeal all of the protections that were put into place in 2015 and which existed before then and move to a regime where there are no write rules and the FTC, it will be put in charge of enforcing any violations of the ISP's stated conduct rules or anything anti-competitive. So this is a dramatic change in how sort of the broadband providers are overseen by the federal government. Fair enough. So who's currently for these changes besides the FCC? This is largely the dream plan for the communications industry, telecoms. So the big backers here are Verizon, Comcast, AT&T. They say that if they were freed from these protections, they would be able to make a lot more money and then they would bring broadband to rural areas. What are some issues that shouldn't be included in this debate on net neutrality? Because a lot of times, and I'm sure you've seen this, right, especially with your time at Wired and other things you've done, you get an issue like this and then all of a sudden there's all these articles and some of them aren't necessarily correlated to the core issue at hand. This isn't an article about whether Twitter was overzealous in its filtering out offensive content and caught people up in that. It's not about the power of Facebook's algorithms or the dominance of the platforms. Those are interesting arguments. I've been very skeptical of those companies for a very long time. What we're interested in here is something foundational, like the way the web has worked since the beginning and what happens if we flip it around where all of a sudden every website and web service around the country is going to have to start paying Comcast, AT&T, and Verizon simply for their content to load or to be in a fast lane. That's a really good summary. So one of the issues at the center of this debate 
is this whole point about whether a business organization is seen as a common carrier and this whole thing about Title II versus Title I. And I find a lot of articles don't really unpack that all that well. Like they kind of do really light justice to it. So why don't you lay that out for us a little bit? Title I or Title II is really essentially two methods that Congress gave the FCC to classify different services. And essentially, this give any rules like sort of their grounding, right? So you have to plant the rules in some sort of legal foundation. Title I is essentially saying someone is an information service provider. So that's folks like Google, Facebook. Way back in the day when you went online with AOL, you really were signing into like AOL services. You know, you would use their chat rooms. They would have their own news service. And then there was like a little portal that would take you out to the web. There's a second bucket, which is known as Title II, which is common carriers, which essentially are things like the phone company, where their job is really just to connect you and send information back and forth. And if something is in that sort of information sending back and forth, they're considered sort of more like crucial infrastructure, and the FCC has much more power. So what the FCC tried to do for a very long time is like we tried to put the broadband providers in that light touch bucket, right? You're an information service, but still be able to say you can't block sites, right? You can't stop people from using the apps of their choice. And unfortunately, the carriers, you know, particularly Comcast and Verizon, kept suing the FCC and saying, you put us in this light regulatory touch category and you're not allowed to regulate us at all. And eventually uh, came down to, in 2014, the federal court said, hey, if you want to have these protections that everybody agrees on, right? No blocking, no throttling, no pay fast lines. That one's a little more contentious. The only way to do that is to say they're a common carrier. And so the FCC said, we'll do that. But starting in 1996, the FCC was given the authority to not apply all of the rules of common carriers. So for instance, by putting Comcast as a, say, your Title II or your common carrier, uh, the FCC can say, okay, well, we're not going to do rate regulation. So Comcast, change your rates as much as you want, which Comcast does like to do. And we're not going to require other things like uh, specifying the size of the print of your bill or requiring you to unbundle your services and rent them to competing ISPs. So it's more about the legal grounding of the rules than the rules themselves. That's a fantastic summary and much better than I've read so far. So that's really good. Thanks. I was reading a Quora thread on net neutrality the other day, and the author stated something that I want to get your reaction to while we're still kind of laying the groundwork here, and then we're going to move into some business-to-business implications. But the author said that one way to think of net neutrality is that it's the difference between UPS charging everyone equally for their package based on weight and size characteristics and how fast you want it there versus them charging you for the value of what's in the package. While that's obviously not a perfect analogy because UPS is a different business model, what do you think about the Quora author and their comment? I really dislike the sort of the FedEx UPS analogy, and I'll tell you why. There's a difference between delivery services like FedEx and Comcast. So if I'm signed up on Comcast, Comcast is the only person that can deliver me that content, right? If I buy something now on Amazon, right, it's like there's FedEx, there's like UPS, there's actually like competition. There's other ways to get packages there. Secondly, Comcast already has mechanisms to do price differentiation, right, for speed. So they can charge me, and they do charge me more for faster speeds. They can charge differently on broadband caps. So I think what that analogy misses is that the broadband market is not competitive, and they have a lot of market power. 51% of Americans, according to the FCC's own numbers from 2016, have only one broadband, like fixed broadband provider. That's very different than the model that we have tons of competition. If all of us had 10 choices of broadband ISPs, we wouldn't be having this debate because the competition would take care of it. That's a good perspective. And it's one of the things I was going to bring up. Your stat was 51. The one I came across was 48%. But it was this idea that when people say this is a free market issue versus a not free market issue to get your reaction to this, that would be the case if, as in the shipping analogy, you actually had DHL, FedEx, UPS, et cetera. Or we won't count on track because I think anybody who's ever shipped an Amazon package hates on track. <laughs> Sorry, on track, but I think that's universally held. But even there, that's a choice of a sort. Whereas the statistic I came across said 48% of Americans don't have a choice. So that's obviously central to this debate at this point, right? The one of the things that bothers me is when people say, you know, net neutrality applies to the internet. Like it really doesn't. It applies to broadband internet access providers because there's two markets here. There's the dysfunctional market of broadband access, the people that get us online. And then there's the 
crazy free market that rides on top of that. So a lot of what net neutrality is doing is protecting the freewheeling market from a dysfunctional market that would like to rent seek and get paid by that larger market because it's in a position where they can essentially hold their users hostage. Let's talk a little bit about what happens if net neutrality goes away or is limited substantially. How does your average business benefit or lose in that result? Once net neutrality, if net neutrality is repealed and is allowed to go into place, these are still big ifs. We're not going to see there's such a public backlash that I don't think we receive like radical changes up front that we're going to be able to see. I think the changes are going to happen at the interconnection points. So this happened in 2013 and 2014, where the companies that were carrying Netflix's traffic to the edges of broadband networks were their points got congested. And normally what happens there is Comcast and say a level three come together, they split the cost and what it takes to add an extra router and some fiber link connection on each side. Comcast said, we're not going to do that anymore. Like, we want you to pay us a lot of money. And Level 3 said, you know, all right, well, how much you want? And this happened not just Comcast. It happened with the six largest ISPs in the country. One of the Level 3 told the FCC that the ISP wanted to charge them as much as Level 3 was already paying or sort of like charging its customers for access to the entire internet just to get to one corner. So what happens there is then the cost of transport, right, if that's allowed to happen under the new rules then the cost of transport of bits will go up, right? Five, 10 percent, about five, 10 percent, five or 10 X. So what that means is that that has to flow back. Level three has to charge all of their customers and every website is going to use some service like level three. So everyone's costs are going to go up, right? All of a sudden, the web hosting that you pay $100 a month for might go up to $200. And all of the services that you use that are on the internet, their costs are going to go up. So they're going to pass those costs onto them. So that rather than the you're going to get a, a plan sent to you by Comcast, it's like here, choose, you know, if you only want to watch YouTube, or you want to watch Hulu, that's going to be the immediate effect. The immediate effect is going to be on businesses and it's going to hit them like in the bottom line in ways that they're really not going to understand. One of the things that has been mentioned a fair amount in articles I've seen is the impact to your average kind of startup, you know, in a B2B context, let's say, and the likelihood that they can get market share or growth the same way they could today. So talk about that a little bit. I left what I thought was a pretty great job as an editor at, at Wired in 2012. I started a company purely on the savings of a journalist. The thing is, is like, you know, most startups now, you don't get funded on an idea. That might have happened in the early, like the mid 1990s. But now when you go even for your first investment, people want to see that you have traction. If you're a B2B company, I just saw an email from uh, Jason Calacanis, who was the first investor in Uber and a big angel investor, runs a bunch of syndicates. He wants to see $10,000 to $150,000 in monthly recurring revenues from B2B companies before those companies get their first investment. So the only way that's possible is if the price of starting a startup remains insanely cheap. What will happen is if the end networks, right, so the Comcast of the world, start to be able to charge startups, right, just to get access to their networks. And whether that's directly to the startup or through the companies that startup uses to deliver their packets, or is able to create fast lanes that are basically a business necessity to be in in order to compete, startups can't afford that. So we're going to see fewer startups. And then if they do get funded, it'll probably be at an earlier point. So investors will be taking more risk and want to have more and investors are going to have to be paying off Comcast on behalf of their startups, and they're going to ask for more equity. So this is a really bad plan for innovation. Like what we've seen with the current sort of model with is we've seen an explosion in startups, right? Whether that's consumer facing or on the B2B side. And it's just gonna like cascade because one of the things I think people don't understand is like startups in, especially in the B2B world, rely on a lot of other startups to run their business. So if every startup's costs go up a little bit, a little bit, like I'm not just passing on my costs, I'm passing on the extra costs that I have to pay to Stripe or to Chargebee or to our image hoster or the myriad number of other services, the marketing services that I use. So if all of those get more expensive, then you've started to create a big business problem. 
Well, that's one of the things I wanted to talk about because a lot of businesses live on the internet in ways they never did before, like you're getting at. They market through the internet, they sell through the internet, a lot of their business processes are through the internet. For example, you use Gusto for payroll, QuickBooks for invoicing, some CRM tool, you've got tools to manage your website. And I think there's this implicit assumption today that if you're that small business, and I'm not even talking about a tech startup now, but you're just any small business and you're kind of new and you've built your infrastructure on these SaaS tools, you're able to pick the best one. There's multiple choices in every category and you're able to pick the best one and you can pick a small one, a medium one, an upstart. And yeah, maybe someday they become a unicorn. But when you started to use them, they were six users and one guy writing code. And it sounds like to some degree that kind of innovation will get squelched and we might have a very limited number of choices for these small businesses when they look to kind of take these business processes and put them online. Yeah, we're both going to have like more limited choice. You're absolutely right. And the choices that are there are going to be more expensive because, yes, if you are a Gusto and you're coming up and or a QuickBooks, you've got to make sure that your site loads quickly. Right. Or that like it's available to Verizon customers. So you have to find that money to pay. And that is I don't know, let's see, a radical sort of like flipping of the model that we've seen over the last 20 years where we don't need permission to innovate and you don't need a ton of money to get things out there, get your first customers. And whether or not that leads to investment or not, it's also made it possible for lots of small businesses to sort of small services to exist without ever having to take a lot of venture capital funding, right? And not even necessarily lifestyle businesses, but good, strong businesses that are just able to offer great value to customers. And I think there's an interesting, I talked with a guy who runs a vape shop, two vape shops in Denver, and he's extremely concerned about net neutrality because of the services that they rely on, right? So whether for them, that's like inventory, they do some online sales, they run all their payroll, and that's, he's exactly looking at that uncertainty and he and his, his brother who, who started the business so they quit smoking we're thinking about opening a third shop but they say they're holding off until they get more certainty about what their costs are going to look like in the next year that's a good story and i think a lot of companies if they looked at what they've been spending on SaaS, your average small company i know our SaaS budget is fairly huge and we're only a dozen or so employees right but if we had to buy all that stuff as on premise or it became much more expensive or our choices were limited, that wouldn't be a place I'd want to be. So I want to walk through a particular scenario just to see if you think this is one of the things we might come across if the net neutrality provisions are kind of demolished or reduced in some way. Let's say QuickBooks decides they're losing to an army of smaller competitors. This happens all the time, right? The big guy finds a bunch of niche competitors that they're losing to and they begin to court ISPs across the US to prioritize the QuickBooks service. And all of a sudden they launch a marketing campaign about how fast QuickBooks is compared to competitors. Is that like the kinds of scenarios we might start to see? I'll up you a little bit there, Sean. QuickBooks could negotiate deals with each of those carriers uh, that were exclusive so that their competitors couldn't get those fast lanes. And that's not necessarily anti-competitive because the person that's offering that contract, right, is AT&T, Verizon, Comcast, and they don't compete in that market, right? They don't offer accounting software. So it's not anti-competitive for them to offer one site, uh, fast lane only, and the other sites are really going to be stuck in the, in the slower lane. That's absolutely possible. And under the proposed rules, I don't see any way that the Federal Trade Commission would step in. They would, you know, under comp anti-competition rules, that's technically legal. Well, and that leads us a bit to the reaction of the big guys to the news, right? I mean, I think it's kind of interesting to watch what Google and Amazon and Facebook and Microsoft, and we could add other companies that, that people would think would be logical in that set, their reactions to this. What do you think about how they're handling the situation? Google was a leader in the net neutrality fight in, say, 2008, um, around 2010, or maybe even earlier than 2008. It was really important for them. Now they're there. Their voices come through the Internet Association, but they're not leading this fight anymore. They can afford the fast lanes uh, from a business sense, like maybe we can gain an advantage here. Their employees are big defenders of net neutrality, so they've never said anything against net neutrality, but they're not the leading voices in this fight, and neither are Facebook, Amazon. It's great that they're saying the right things, same thing with Netflix, but those folks can afford the fast lanes. It's the openness has always been the tool of the incumbents, right? So. If you wanted to go up against somebody's software, you created an open source version of it, right? Or that's sort of the way that you kind of go after these entrenched folks is doing something, is sort of having an open playing field. 
I've got nothing bad to say about them, but I would just say that, like, you know, they're not driving this battle by any means. And, you know, just from what you can watch in the debate, this isn't a fight between, say, Google and Comcast, right? This is really about the entrepreneurs, investors, small businesses, people concerned about free speech, musicians, churches. It's the little folks that are most worried. And I think the little folks are the ones to be, are they are right to be the most worried ones. Fair enough. So let's talk a little bit about the argument that Verizon or Comcast would give, obviously, which is that, and I'm over summarizing a bit, but from what I've seen, it's we built this infrastructure, we built these pipes, we should be able to charge, monetize, slice, dice them however we want. That's exactly their argument. Starting in 2005, Ed Whitaker, then the president of SBC, now the president of AT&T. Calls a lot of waves when he says Google and other folks are crazy if they think they're going to get to use my pipes for free. The thing that 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 misses is kind of what the FCC is all has gone after for a very long time, which is kind of when it's the virtuous circle, which is people don't buy broadband just to get broadband. People buy broadband because of the cool stuff they can do online, like the apps and services. So the more apps and services there are, the more demand there is for broadband, the more demand there is, for, the more broadband there is, the cooler services you can build, right? That was something the FCC has gone after for a very long time. So we've seen Chairman Powell put in principle in 2004. He lectured the industry in 2004 about, said, here are the four freedoms, right, going back to 2004. So this is a Republican saying, I mean, you should let Americans get to the content of their choice. You should let them use the websites of their choice. You should let them use the devices of their choice. And you have to be transparent. And then when Comcast blocked a peer-to-peer -peer in 2008, Republican Chairman Martin held a bunch of public hearings, went after them, and got them to agree to stop blocking applications. But this is definitely what they want to do, right? So Verizon told a federal court in 2013 that it should have the right to charge any website any amount of money. And if that company doesn't pay up, they should be able to be blocked. And that, they said, is not actually no blocking. Blocking defined by Verizon means just blocking a site on content reasons only. The thing is that, that upends the model, right, which is essentially that customers pay Verizon to get them all the things that they want online. Verizon charges them and everybody else pays their bandwidth. Going the other way actually gets us back to like an older billing model, that telephone model. And if you remember how expensive, and it probably still is, but to make a landline phone call from, say, the United States to India, right? That used to be something like $2 a minute. And that was because there was a regime where telecoms in India would say, you have to pay us this much money to take that phone call in. This is a gigantic shift in the economic model of the internet. And I think it's a really bad one. The model we've been under since the US, since the inception of the internet in the US has allowed that crazy flourishing. And to flip that around, I think is foolhardy at best. One other thing, just to talk about it from the Verizon and Comcast side, is a lot of the assumption has been, I think, that partly, I think, because of past history and past comments they've made, that all the business models they might create are going to be bad ones. Why is that such a strong assumption to make? I think it's from watching what they've, they've done before. I mean, listen, I think the, the industry has done some really great work in figuring out how to make DSL faster, how to make cable internet faster. 4G is fantastic. Really interested to see what happens with 5G. But on their business model side, that's largely like, turns out to be like, hey, it looks like mafia tactics, right? It was essentially like holding Netflix hostage in 2013, 2014 until they get paid. It's a lot like, you know, it sort of boils down to like, it's a pretty site that you've got there. It'd be a shame if people couldn't visit it. They have lots of reasons to innovate on their network and to get people the services that they want, right? I don't see that the sort of innovating on the core business model, which would allow an, an inefficient market to put toll booths on the efficient market. I just don't buy it. I just haven't seen them propose anything that I think is doesn't distort that larger market. Fair point. So one last question, actually two last questions. One, is there any other model that you could point to. There's been stories about Portugal and net neutrality, and people have said that's a good example or that's a bad example to look at. Are there any kind of examples or touchstones people should look at when they're trying to picture what a world would look like without net neutrality? 
Yeah, so I think there's a couple places you can look. So from 2009 to 2016, uh, the Portugal example is flawed and it's weird. And we don't want to go into how deep that how deep that goes. So let's talk about Europe from 2009 to 2016. They never had the sort of de facto regime that we had in the U.S. They never had a cop on the beat there. So the plans that we saw, and even though they had a more competition there, especially in the wireless space, we still saw lots of blocking of Skype. So you would get plan offerings that would say if you're on the basic plan, you can't use Skype at all. If you're on the medium plan, like you can buy an add-on or if you buy this very expensive plan, you can get Skype. They did the same thing to instant messaging services. So if you wanted to use WhatsApp, you're going to have to pay more. Same thing with peer-to-peer. -peer. We also saw weird things that would happen in, uh, we've seen in UK, where peer-to-peer -peer services or the carriers were allowed to kind of mess with peer-to-peer -peer services, which caught up gaming companies, right? So gaming companies often distribute their patches and their software via peer-to-peer -peer because they're just, as soon as something comes out, people are monstrously interested and they need to get it out. And it would get caught up in this peer-to-peer -peer blocking and filtering. And then eventually they would have to go to the ISPs, one of them to sort of come in and say like, okay, before you release your next like feature or game, tell us how it works so we can make sure our filters don't capture it. So like that gets us to the that scary point where like we're going to have to go back to the land of cell phones pre-iPhone or where you couldn't get onto a phone with an app without getting permission and paying a phone company to get on that phone. And I don't think we want to go there. Like what we've seen out of innovation is like we have a really good balance right now. Like nobody's going to say the broadband providers like Verizon and AT&T and Comcast aren't doing financially well. They've got lots of incentive to invest in their networks. We've seen an explosion of startups over there. So the question is for the FCC is why are we peeling these rules without any replacement, throwing uncertainty in the marketplace? Like even if you don't like Title II and you think that Congress should step in and write the rules to finish it, why repeal without replace? It doesn't make any sense. Good summary. Last question for you, just what resources, websites should folks look at if they want to learn more about the debate? If you already have your mind made up and you want to talk to Congress and ask them to uh, stop the FCC vote, uh, that's battleforthenet.com. In terms of learning more, I think there's some good historical pieces uh, written by Professor Barbara Van Shevik, who, full disclosure, is my boss. But she wrote a piece for Fortune recently, kind of laying out, I think, what is key, which is that I think people think that net neutrality showed up in 2015. And that's not the case. We've really had an FCC that's worried about this for a very long time, starting pre-2004, but like at least till 2004. And that was a piece in Fortune magazine. And then I think there's been some good explainers done by folks like Timothy B. Lee, folks at Vox, Ars Technica has done some really great work here. So has Motherboard. So I think, you know, looking for the, uh, the informed sources on the tech press is good because these are folks that have been covering this issue for a very long time. Excellent list of sources. I've been a big fan of ours for a long time. Not to say I don't like any of the other ones. I like a lot of those too, but ours has always done a good job. So just want to thank you for being on the show. You shared a lot of great stuff, and I'm sure the listeners appreciated listening to it. Great, Sean. Thank you so much for having me on. And that concludes my interview with Ryan. I truly enjoyed chatting with him. I think he had a lot of great perspectives to share about net neutrality, and it's a great subject to get educated about. Thanks for listening to this episode of the show, and don't forget to visit us at cascadeinsights.com. Mm -hmm.